But in today's lesson, we're going to look at when can you find a limit by just directly substituting the value x is approaching. Okay? So there are four kind of specific cases and then one general rule that kind of define when we can find the limit by directly substituting. The first of these is a polynomial function. Secondly is a radical function, except like in the example we looked at yesterday where you're approaching the end point of that radical function. All right, so you can have a polynomial function, you can have a radical function except for at the end point, you can have exponential functions, and I, I guess we could also include in this the logarithmic functions as well, okay? Also, transformations of sine and cosine, all right? But what do you notice about all of these functions? All of these functions are what, are, what we would call continuous, okay? Does someone remember what continuous means? Um, not necessarily. What? Follows a pattern. Uh, well, that's periodic. That was for sine and cosine. Same shape repeats, kind of? No, that, again, is periodic. A continuous function is one that doesn't have any holes or asymptotes. In other words, you could draw the entire thing without lifting your pencil. That's kind of a simplistic definition of it, but if I can draw the whole graph without having to pick up my pencil and jump to a different point like that, then I have a continuous function, all right? And then this general rule, you would say, well, what about the ones that are not continuous? Well, there are some strategies for finding uh, limits as we approach those points of discontinuity, which we'll look at later. But as long as you are not approaching one of those points of discontinuity, you actually can simply plug in the value of x that you want to approach to and evaluate the function there. Okay? Doesn't a radical function have asymptotes or no? Uh, you're thinking rational. Well, like that, what you drew for radical functions, isn't, wouldn't there be an asymptote? It's not an asymptote, it's a, it's a um, end point. And two, it doesn't, the horizontal asymptote would be okay. We're talking about vertical oh, asymptotes. Oh, oh, oh. I should have clarified that. Okay. But, um, but here's the thing. Let's say we did have some kind of a rational function like this. And it's got this asymptote right here. Mm -hmm. Now, if I have x approaching the value for this asymptote, then no, I can't just plug it in because it's not even defined there. But if I had x approaching, like, if this is x equals 5, if I were finding the limit as x approached 5, and I know that it's continuous around 5, then I can just plug in 5 into the function and figure out what the limit equals. Okay? So this is an important thing because it saves you a lot of work. Um, if, you, if you recognize that it's continuous around that point, then you can just plug in the number. Okay? Now, let's look at, a, look at a couple of specifics here, okay? Some limit theorems or properties of limits. Some specific examples. We already mentioned if you have a polynomial function, then the limit as x approaches c of that polynomial is simply f of c. Just kind of reiterating what we saw in that first case. If it's a polynomial, you can simply evaluate Another continuous function is the constant function. If it's simply a horizontal line, then it's always going to equal that value. No matter what x is approaching, it's always going to equal whatever that constant is. All right, so those are kind of our, our two examples. Another one, and this is one that's super helpful, is this constant multiple. The limit of a constant multiple of a function 
is the multiple times the limit of the function. So notice here what we have, okay? We have the limit as x approaches c of b times f of x. And what this is saying is that if we find the limit as x approaches c of f of x, we can simply multiply the limit by b rather than multiplying the function by b and then finding the limit of that. All right? Let's look at an example of of where this is useful, okay? We want to find the limit as x approaches pi over 3 of the sine function, okay? So sine is continuous for all values of x, so we can simply plug in pi over 3. And what is sine of pi over 3? Other one. It's radical 3 over 2. Radical 3 over 2, okay? Radical 3 over 2, unit circle, okay? So that's the limit. It's the same thing as evaluating the function because that function's constant. But check this out. What if I had the limit as x approaches pi over 3 of root 3 times the sine of x? Well, since that is a constant, root 3, I can pull the root 3 out, and it's going to be root 3 times the limit as x approaches pi over 3 of sine of x. Well, we already know what that equals. That is root 3 over 2. Okay, so we have a, now a root 3 times root 3 over 2. Is this sine Which, a continuous function? Is the sine a continuous a, function? A segment that stops because it doesn't have hold? Uh, if you don't go to the endpoints, then yeah. If you, as long as you're taking the limit of anywhere except for the endpoint, like I said with the rational function. And you don't have a right. Yeah. Okay. So here we have root 3 times root 3 over 2. It's just 3 over 2. Okay. So you don't have to find some other new thing. You can just take the limit you already know and multiply it by the constant. Okay, Rachel? What is the limit? Like, the limit is the y value that your function is getting close to as x gets close to whatever number you're choosing there. x is here and getting closer to pi over 3. Okay. okay? So as we look at our sine curve... There's our sine curve. As x approaches pi over 3, our y is approaching root 3 over 2. Okay? In this case, it does happen to equal root 3 over 2 because we've got a continuous function. Other cases, though, it doesn't necessarily have to equal it. It's just what are we approaching. Okay? Mr. Yes? If you... Uh, divide both sides by radical 3, wouldn't it give you a different result? 1 over 2. Both sides of what? Both sides of the equation by radical 3. Well, we're not solving an equation oh, here. It it's just, we're just cancel. evaluating a limit. Okay. Yeah. We'll cancel it. Okay. Now, here's another limit theorem. The limit of a sum. Now, this is this is going to be helpful when you've got these these functions where there's a bunch of different parts added or subtracted, and um, and you recognize part of it. Okay, you recognize part of it. You're not sure about the other part. Okay, so we see in there we see an x squared plus three x, and we know that that would be a quadratic function. And we know the quadratic functions are always continuous, all right? So whether we write it down or not, at least in our heads, we can think of this as the limit as x approaches 5 of x squared plus 3x, okay? Okay.
And then we can add to that the limit as x approaches 5 of this radical x over radical x minus 1. Okay? Now, the reason why we're thinking this way, again, you may not write this down once you get the hang of it, but you can just focus in on the one function that you're not as familiar with and make sure that that's something that would be continuous or maybe you have to use a different strategy in order to find that part of the limit. But I at least for now can just do 25 plus 15 and say, okay, well, this right here equals 40. Now I just need to figure out what this one is. And this is where you start thinking about the domain of the function. Okay? So for this right here, what would the domain of this function be? Okay, well, x, what could x not be? x X can't be 1, and also, since it's in a radical, x can't be negative. negative, okay? So x has to be greater than 0, but not equal to 1, okay? Mm -hmm. Is 5 greater than 0, but not equal to 1? Yes. Yes, so is this function going to be continuous around 5? Continuous. Yes. There is an asymptote, there is an endpoint, but we're not approaching the asymptote or the endpoint here. So we know that it's safe to just plug in radical 5 over radical 5 minus 1. Okay, and we get a 2.23 over a 1.23. Not equals um, plus forty, so that's going to be um, forty one and what would that be? Uh, seventy seven plus twenty three, ninety, eighty, and eighty one hundred twenty thirds. There we go. Now, one other, product, one other uh, uh, rule for limits is the product, okay? If you have two functions multiplied together, like you have here, the limit as x approaches 5 of x squared plus 2 times x minus 7, okay? I don't have to FOIL that together. I know that since x squared plus 2 is continuous, and I know that x minus 7 is continuous, I can take the limit of each continuous function by plugging them in, and then I can just multiply the limits together. Okay? So essentially what I'm doing here, and again, you may not write this down once you've got the hang of it, but you're at least thinking this in your head. All right, what's the limit of that? Well, that would be 27, because I can just plug it in, times the limit as x approaches 5 of x minus 7. Well, what's the limit of that? That's a negative 2, because I can just plug it in. And then I get a negative 54 for my limit. Okay, so you don't have to FOIL it together. Even something like this over here, sine times tangent. Okay? I know that sine is continuous for all values of x, so as x approaches pi over 2, I can simply do sine of x, sine of pi over 2, equals... You remember? Sine of pi over That's pi over 4. Is zero. Pi over 2 is 1. 1. Okay? But then we have to multiply that by the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of tangent. Well, let's think about tangent. Tangent, we know, has some asymptotes, right? It's going to be radical 2. Where is tangent undefined? Zero. It's oh, sine yeah. over cosine, right? Zero. Yeah. So at, at 0, let's think about it. At 0... Sine is 0, cosine is 1, right? So what does tangent equal? 
zero. So it's defined there. What about up here at pi over two? Yeah, there, because it's zero, one, tangent is undefined. Okay? So what's one times undefined? Undefined. Undefined. So what do we say about the limit? The limit... Is undefined. No, it does not exist. Nope, it's because it fell okay, up. do not use do not use the term undefined to describe a limit. We would say the limit not does right. not exist. Why and not? you can just put D N E does not exist. All right, one other helpful one here is the limit of a power. Okay? If we have the limit of a function raised to a power we can take the limit of that function and then raise the limit to the power. Okay? Now, you can see the notation there, but let's kind of see this in action, all right? Here's a case where, yeah, we could expand this out, but then we're going to have to do 21 cubed and we're going to have to do our binomial expansion and stuff. And it's only Q, but what if it were to the 8th power or something like that? We really don't feel like having to do that. But we recognize here that we have a continuous function, all right, inside the, inside the parentheses. So what we can do instead is we can take the limit as x approaches 5, of just the x squared minus 21 and then cube that. This kind of has a dual purpose. One, um, it helps us on, on certain ones where it's way too big to expand or at least to expand easily, but it also helps us keep our numbers smaller because now if I plug in 5 that limit equals 4, and it's just 4 cubed, which is 64, okay? We can even do this with radicals. Now, a cube root, if you remember a cube root function, it actually is continuous for all values of x, okay? So what we can do, uh, what exponent would represent a cube root? One the one-third power, okay? So I could do the limit as x approaches 7 here of the x squared plus 4x minus 10, and then I could do that to the one-third power, okay? So if I plug in 7... I get 49 minus 40 minus 10, so I get a negative 1. So I have negative 1 to the 1 third power. Wait, why do you, you do 49 plus 40, but it should be 28. Oh, wait, wait. Shoot, I'm getting my 10s and 7s mixed up. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right, so 49 plus 28, 28 would be 77. Minus 10 would be 67. Okay. 49, 28. Yeah. 77. So 67. So now I'm just taking the cube root of 67. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Like yeah. Can you leave it like that? Or? Yeah, you can leave it like that, unless you see like a perfect cube, but yeah. I want to say 67 might be prime. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So. It's like. 4.06. 4.06? Okay. Yeah. All right. So here, here we get the rational functions. Okay, and this again, this is the type that we've got to check. The limit of the rational function is the quotient of the limits. Now, notice here, 
I'm using rational kind of loosely because back in, uh, in our third unit, when we were looking at rational functions, we defined those as two polynomials divided, okay? Here, we're actually using rational function a little more loosely to describe any two functions that are being divided in a fraction or a ratio, okay? And this will apply that we can take the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator as long as the denominator is not approaching zero, because then you'd be dividing by zero, okay? So, the reason why we have to consider this is because, again, we have our domain. What is the domain of this rational function? X cannot equal negative 2. Are we approaching negative 2? No. No, we're approaching 3. So is the function continuous where we want it to be? Yes. Yes, okay. When you, when you say, like, is it approaching, you mean, uh, like, where it's, if, when it starts from 3? No, no, no. As we get closer to 3, so, like, as we go 2, 2 and a half, 2 and 3 quarters, 2 and 7 eighths, we get closer and closer, 2.99999. Or at, from the other end, you know, 3.5, 3.1, 3.01, you know. As we get closer to 3 and from either side, is it going to be continuous there? And it is in this case. All right? So we can simply take the limit of the top. That's a, that's a parabola, so I can just plug it in. And I get uh, 9 plus 6 minus 5, so that's 10. And I can take the limit of the bottom. The limit of the bottom is a line, so I can, it's continuous, so I can just plug it in, and I get the limit equal to 2 here. Okay? X is approaching 3. Okay. Again, you missed yesterday, so you need to go back and review all of that. Yeah, I mean, you can't just have a limit because the, you have to have the limit as x is approaching something. Okay. So if there's x approaching negative 2, it would be does not exist. If it were x approaches negative 2, we would have to do some other work with this potentially. It could be limit does not exist if that's actually an asymptote. If it were a whole, the limit still could exist. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at later. And actually, down here, you'll see an example. We have an indeterminate form. Notice here, if I end up with 0 over 0, if x is approaching 36 in this example here, I'd have 36 minus 36 over 6 minus 6. So I'd have 0 over 0. Okay, this is what's known as an indeterminate form. Now, the limit here might exist. Okay? We got to do some other stuff to try to figure it out. Okay? Now, if it ends up with a number over zero, then you know that that value was an asymptote, so the limit will not exist. But when it's zero over zero, typically we can find where that actually does exist because that value is going to give us a whole rather than an asymptote, okay, if you get 0 over 0. Question? So if you always check the numerators to make sure it's isn't 0 over 0, we immediately see it's uh, equal 0 at the bottom. Yeah, double check, because if it's 0 on the top and bottom, you can usually deal with that, as we'll see later on, okay? What do you mean 0 on the top and bottom? 0 over 0, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. If it's an indeterminate form, we typically can find a value... We just haven't learned how to yet, okay? All right, so use the weekend, catch up, those of you who need to catch up, and do the practice, okay?